Good evening. I'd like to call to order the August 28, 2014 regular monthly meeting of the Scarborough Sanitary District. We'll start with roll call. Dave Nelson. Here. Charlie Anderson. Here. Nick Rico. Here. Ben Viola. Here. Rob McSorley. Here. Seth Garrison. Here. I am Chairman Jason Greenleaf. Next, uh, first item of business here is uh, the approval of the minutes from the July 24th 2014 regular monthly meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, the July 24th, 2014 workshop on the accessory units. Move approval. Second. Any questions, errors, or omissions? None. All in favor of approval? None opposed. Next will be the July 24th, 2014 regular monthly meeting minutes. Move approval. Second. Any questions, errors, or omissions? Uh, okay. Oh, go ahead, Doug. No, go ahead. Nick. Last page. Please use one seat in repo. Okay. Um, page four. This might be just an editorial thing. First paragraph, Mr. McSorley said he would recuse from voting. Normally you recuse oneself or himself. And on page, page yep. four, right at the top, first sentence. And this is an editorial, it's just a question. On page five, it said Mr. Anderson made a motion and then followed up with a motion I made. Was that an amendment to the original motion? I, I wasn't able to follow the sequence there very well. I can't, I can't either. We'll check the tape. Yep. That's fine. Any others? Ben, did you have some? Oh, just on the first page, uh, Hughes is, I'm not sure if it's, it's two S's in that or, or just an apostrophe. <laughs> I believe it's just an apostrophe. At least that's how I was yeah. taught. Good catch, Ben. Yeah. A correction Mr. Hughes is. <laughs> <laughs> Those blasted apostrophes. Hey, anything else from anybody? Not all in favor of approval. I'm opposed. <coughs> we'll move to the superintendent and operations report. Dave? I'm up the report of operations, a uh, copy of which is uh, in your packet for the month of July. Our average effluent flow for the month was 1.4 million gallons per day. Our effluent quality was well within our permitted limits for all parameters. We achieved 98% COD removal and 98% total suspended solids removal with average concentration to 6 and 5 milligrams per liter respectively. Copy of the pump station flows for the month of July is also included in the packet. No issues are noted. Uh, on August 20th, um, we met with the fire department to review the fire suppression systems in both the sodium hypochlorite storage area and in pump station 6. Uh, within the, the hypo room, there is a dry chemical suppression system. I had questioned the need for such a system since hypo is not flammable. And upon review from the fire department, it is not needed. It, it was thought that it was a holdover from the chlorine gas system that was previously used. Uh, pump station six has an automatic sprinkler system. As previously mentioned, I, I am concerned with this type of suspension, su suppression system in a critical structure such, such as six. And the fire department has visited the pump station with me and uh, is currently reviewing the codes to suite, see what our options are there. We had three odor complaints this past month, one from um, 5 Avenue 1 and two from 11 Iris Drive. During each event, district staff went, to, went out to investigate, but no detectable odors caused by the sewer were identified at, um, in any of those events. And let's see, uh, oh, once again, Ken Welch has passed um, all the DMRQA 34 testing requirements for the analytical analysis that we conduct in the laboratory. And one last thing, um, the, in Sunday's paper, there will be a public notice 
um, that the district has um, the notices the notice of intent uh, to file the main waste discharge license, main pollution discharge elimination system permit application. Um, that's for our permit renewal for our outfall at the uh, uh, for the treatment plant, and so that will be in Sunday's paper, and I will be sending mailings out to the abutters of the um, the outfall also. Any questions for the superintendent? I got a question. Ben. So, are there any changes to our license, or we're just getting a renewal? This the is same this way? is just the initial application. We won't know of any changes until they come back with a draft permit. I know of none that are okay. in the works right now. Any other questions? I have one. Uh, what what are your intentions with the? Fire suppression system in the hypochlorite storage area. Uh, we're going to pull it out. Uh, it, it, it's something that, because of the type of system that, that it is, it requires um, uh, biannual maintenance. So twice a year, uh, we're paying a thousand dollars for AAA fire to, to come in and inspect it and do some replace some uh, fusible link in it or something like that. Okay. And there is. A System in place already in that building, or no? No, it's just we don't need it. We don't need anything. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? With that, we'll move on to correspondence. Uh, item A is the main DEP incident reports. We had three incidences which required the district to contact DEP and fill out incident reports. On July 29th, a utility contractor was installing a light pole on Route 114. The contractor had called Dig Safe and the, and the district prior to doing any work. The district marked the approximate location of the force main, but due to changes within the intersection since the original ties were taken, the location mark was off. When AMD Electric set up the, uh, to drill, they were approximately four feet from our location mark. However, our force main was actually directly below their drill. The drill penetrated our six inch force main, causing the break in our force main. We were able to shut off the pump stations quickly and called in two septic trucks uh, to haul sewage from the impacted station. We also uh, called Risbera Construction to complete the repair. The repair was completed and the pump station returned to service at approximately 5.30 that evening. Uh, let's see. Uh, at the wastewater treatment uh, facility at about 8.30 p.m. Wednesday evening on August 13th, a significant rain event occurred within the Portland Scarborough area that resulted in more than six inches of rain, most of which fell within an hour and a half period, which resulted in our influent flows going from a rate of 1,200 gallons per minute to a peak of 4,200 gallons per minute. This peak flow of 4,200 gallons per minute was sustained for five hours. It is thought that the significant increase in flow was due to submerged manhole covers in addition to illegal thumb pump connections. These heavy rains flooded many of the local streets, submerging many of our 2,200 manholes that, we, that the district owns, owns um, within the public right away. With the high peak flows, the secondary clarifiers were not able to retain all of the solids, which resulted in an F1 permit exceedance for settable solids and in total suspended solids uh, for that, that day. And, um, at 36 hour per view, at about 8.30 p.m., uh, as a result of that same rain event, um, um, the, we had high flows in the sewers that serviced the home at 36 hour per view, which caused the surcharge of the sewer within the street. Since the elevation of the toilet within the basement of the home is lower than the rim elevation of the manhole, sewage overflowed the toilet and into the finished basement. The homeowner was home at the time and removed the toilet and placed a plug in the line as well as plug in the drain line of the adjacent sink. At about midnight, we received a call from police dispatch and immediately responded. We checked the surrounding manholes and found several manholes surcharged but flowing. Not knowing if there was a restriction in the line or not, we began jetting the lines. Although there was no obvious blockage, they worked until about 3 a.m., making sure everything was flowing and, and the surcharge at that point had, had decreased. The homeowner was looking for the district to cover these, his cost of repair. I avoid this claim onto our insurance carrier, and they're currently working with the homeowner to review it. Are there any questions on that item or items of correspondence? 
Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, number one, um, do you have any recommendations on maybe sealing some manholes or INI studies for looking for sump pumps uh, out in the system? Any thoughts on that? We're always looking at the, the, the sump pumps. We, we don't have a, um, um, in generally, we have a very tight system, and I review it monthly during the, uh, the pump station review. If you notice, there's a column in there at the very bottom of the analysis where it reviews uh, peak to average ratios. Yeah. And so I look at that on a monthly basis, and any time there is an area that does have a high peak, we uh, make a concerted effort to go out and check and find where the, the water is coming from. And typically, we've been very successful as a result of that, of identifying areas where excess water is coming from. With regard to sump pumps, um, they're, they're difficult. You've got to catch them when they're running. Uh, we've done mailings in the past where we'll, we'll send out a mailing um, to, ident to remind people that sump pumps are, are, are not allowed and illegal. Um, I think with this event, it probably warrants another mailing in that regard. The other question I had just briefly is um, what is our policy given that there's tort claim restrictions in the state of Maine on compensation and, and how have we handled that in the past? I don't have an answer for you. I don't, I don't know. I, I'd have to do a look into that for you or Charlie could answer. Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, typically uh, the district has no liability for a claim of this type unless the district was negligent in performing its maintenance responsibilities. Um, and I think the superintendent followed the established procedure of the district to forward the claims to our insurance company for their, for their review and evaluation. Thank you. Our, our ordinance, um, our sewer ordinance does state that actually. <clears throat> Any other questions? Moving on to the next item of correspondence, this is labeled B. Angelo Ruma took. <laughs> I'm not going to open that. <laughs> uh, 36 hour away, yes. hour view lane. Uh, as a result of this backup, a letter was sent to the homeowner with regard to the sewer backup at 36 hour view lane, um, in which I advised him that backwater valves are, re are a requirement of the. Um, Main State Internal Plumbing Code on his basement plumbing fixtures, and if he decides to keep those fixtures in service, he needs to install those um, backwater valves on those fixtures. Yes, Mr. Sir. Chairman, I, I, yeah, I'm sympathetic to anybody who has a problem of this type in their, in their finished basement, but I think maybe um, this would be an opportunity for us to publicize uh, through this meeting, but also perhaps on our website and uh, and uh, through the uh, code enforcement office of the town uh, to be sure that we s can continue to communicate and make folks aware of what these requirements are. You know, the backflow preventer probably would have saved this individual completely from this, from this situation, and I would suspect that there probably are numerous other plumbing connections that by our regulations should be equipped with backflow preventers um, that probably are not because of the manner in which they were installed. And uh, some of these happen, you know, as basements are finished by folks after they've been in their buildings. Uh, some of them are sort of casual projects, do-it-yourself types of projects. Um, and uh, folks may or may not go through the formal permit process, but uh, I think it's uh, incumbent on folks when they do something like this to make sure they really know what they're doing, that they're not just handy, you know, doing some of this stuff and leave themselves open to these kind of problems um, later on and then come seeking relief where there might not be any. So uh, I, I would just encourage us to work uh, through the code enforcement office and with our own publications and website to sort of get this kind of word out to folks as much as we can for their own uh, for their own well-being. 
And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this was an issue at this in this particular address in the past, and we did address it at that point. That is my understanding, yes. Um, and I have been working with code enforcement with regards to backwater valves and educating them and from the local contractors about the need and making sure that um, uh, they are getting addressed as we move forward. Yeah, I just wanted to <coughs> echo what Mr. Anderson said and, and to say that, uh, you know, this is not just a financial issue for the homeowner, but it's also a health and safety issue as well, too. You know, it could lead to mold issues, and if you have small children, a lot of issues. So it's certainly very important for homeowners to be attentive to it. Thanks. Nick. So, Chairman, I was just curious, Dave, have you made any um, recommendations on type of backwater valve yet, or have you found one that or a certain type that works pretty well, or? I haven't made any recommendations. I leave it up. No, I, I don't, you know, it's not something the district owns. It's just, you know, it, it's something the homeowner owns. Uh, I just, um, when, I, when I am talking to either a contractor about it or a homeowner about it, you know, I just make sure that they understand they, you know, it's something that's probably going to need maintenance, so it should be located in an area that needs to be maintenance. Mm -hmm. There are... There is a style out there that could be buried out in the yard that is accessible and maintain maintainable um, from outside. But there's also, if you have uh, some plumbing fixtures that are below grade, but the majority of the house is above grade, you're probably more inclined to, you'd be better inclined to service just the below grade fixtures with a backwater valve and let the other plumbing structures uh, flow freely. So. Thank you. There are several of them out there, and there's, there's, there's always there's more every day that are coming into development. So this, is, this has become a very hot issue. Any other comments? Um, just a, a question on an earlier item on the superintendent's report on the force main break. Um, it seems to me that the explanation that was given for the uh, error in accurately locating the force main was that the subsequent construction subsequent to the record to the ties being taken to the location of the force main was adjusted and the and the tie points basically were moved or altered so that we had to guesstimate the location of the of the line yeah. is there a uh, is there a mechanism whereby we could you know, use GPS or satellite-based uh, equipment to locate these lines and, and uh, try to be more precise and reliable in our locations. I'll have to give that some thought. Um, I, I suspect there is. Um, moving forward, I am now having um, a detectable locating tape placed over all our force mains and sewer services. Uh, whether gravity, you know, the gravity sewer service is a classic of being very difficult to trace. Sure, plastic. Um, and, and the majority of our force mains are also plastic, so um, those are very difficult to chase. So let me review that and see what we have for options. Yeah, I think it would be prudent. I know we have a lot of GPS data on the mapping of the <coughs> systems and don't know whether that would be readily convertible to coordinates that might get us within you know, three feet of the actual field location or not, but I'll, I'll leave that to you. I wasn't really meaning to put you on the spot for an answer tonight, but just to, just basically to ask you to look into it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rob. When we're unsure of this, I know that when um, some of the underground cable companies mark out, they kind of give a limit of what they mark. Uh, and if we're unsure of something, could we, you know, basically say, hey, we're here, we believe we're here, but we're in this vicinity? Because I guess I tell you, on most of my projects that contractors work on, if there's something anywhere in the area, their digging would care, okay. yeah. you know, even if the thing's four feet away. You know? I think that, you know, the problem was is it's not that we were unsure. We thought, he thought, he, he knew where it was, um, and uh, he was fairly confident. And, you know, we, we should have recognized the fact that the, with the ties being um, not readily available, we, we could have 
approached it that way. Should we notify all contractors in the future that, hey, we're in the vicinity here and you need to take due care whether you're four feet or one foot? Well, they are required. There, there is a requirement with regards to dig safe. There's a window they give you anyway. We were just outside of that window by a smidge. Anything else on correspondence? And we'll move on to old business. First item is Eastern Village Phase 3. On behalf of Ballantyne Development, uh, Phase Cloth and Thorndike Associates is requesting district approval to connect and discharge into the sewer the wastewater from 14 lots from Phase 3 of the Eastern Village subdivision and defers reserving sewer capacity for the remaining 22 lots. Phase 3 consists of a total of 36 lots. The sewer extension will consist of approximately 1,615 linear feet of 8-inch diameter gravity sewer with 11 manholes and sewer services to each of the 36 lots. The sewer extension, manholes, and sewer service laterals within the public right-of-way would be transferred over to the sanitary district upon completion of the project. I recommend approval with the following conditions. The project is, w is within the original sewer service area. The original lot had an allocation of 52 residential dwelling units. Phase 1, 2, 2A, and 2B utilized 47 of the uh, allotted 52 lots. The remaining five dwelling units for the allocation have been assigned to lots 100 to 103 and 106 of phase 3. The remaining nine lots are subject to a capacity reserve fee. This capacity reserve fee is based on the single family residential dwelling unit without accessory units. Any additional dwelling units or accessory units in excess of this are subject to additional approvals and capacity reserve fees. The current capacity reserve fee per home is $2,862.29. That's based on the July 2014 ENR. Um, and it's adjusted monthly. Based on the current ENR index, the total capacity reserve fee due for the 14 dwelling units is $25,760.62. Capacity reserve fee is due prior to issuance of the sewer extension permit. A copy of the recorded subdivision plan shall be provided to the district in both electronic and paper copy. Detectable, all sewer services shall have detectable underground utility marking tape placed approximately three feet below grade, directly above the pipe. Final plan signed and stamped by a licensed professional engineer submitted to the superintendent for approval. The sewer extension permit is required. A complete application associated fee for this uh, shall be submitted to the district prior to any sewer extension work. The sewer permit is required for each house. A complete application and associated fee shall be submitted to the district at the time the permit is executed. Prior to the permit being executed, no site sewer work shall be completed. The installation of sewer sewer service shall be inspected and approved by the district and professionally surveyed electronic geo reference CAD drawings and stamped PDF of the CAD drawings um, uh, shall be submitted to the district upon completion of the project. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman, with the caveats attached by the superintendent. <coughs> Motion to have a second. 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 I think Charlie beat him to the point. Oh, Charlie beat me. <laughs> Either way. Hey, any questions, comments, Charlie? Uh, I'm a little confused on the capacity reserve fee for phase three. Um, phase three consists of 36 lots. Um, the proposal is to pay a capacity reserve fee on, on 14 lots. Does that leave 22 lots uh, without the fee having been paid? or am I misreading the presentation that you made? You are not misreading the presentation. That is exactly correct. So the request then is for sewer extension permits to service all 36 lots and for the sewer service connections to be run from the main to all of the 36 lots. Um, my understanding was that the... Um, capacity reserve fee was supposed to be paid for complete phases of projects when they're approved. Um, that, am I am I that has been the in error process. They're requesting only approval of, of the fourteen lots in this phase. 
if you, if you so I guess I'm troubled by that. Um, I'm not sure if the superintendent had a recommendation that he intended on us departing from that practice. I, I'm a little bit troubled by doing it simply because uh, it's not unusual for us to have folks come in to us and tell us they had no idea that they were responsible for this financial obligation. Um, somebody can buy a lot um, from in a, in a subdivision, not buying a completed home, so they're just buying the property, they come in at a later date, and then we're dealing with um, a resident homeowner who had no awareness that they were going to have to be charged this fee when they came to see us for a sewer permit. And uh, so this, I mean, this is, we've got running issues with folks who didn't know they were supposed to have to pay fees to the district, and I just see it as a um, way for us to continue to get, you know, little black eyes and bumps and bruises from folks in the public, which collectively will foster a negative opinion about the district operations. You know, somebody comes in and they're hit with a, you know, surprise $3,000 fee for a permit that they had no idea they were responsible for paying because it just wasn't obvious to them and it wasn't conveyed to them at the time of a real estate transaction or whatever. Um, and we have no way of knowing before the fact that these things are going to be sold. So, I mean, historically, and I think prudently, we've required when people come to us and ask for the approvals, we're willing to give the approvals as long as they pay the fees for what they're asking for. So I'm troubled by that, and uh, I guess I need to hear some feedback from you on it. Um, well, the, the, I'm not quite sure. The the uh, feedback I have is that um, you know, the, the this is what the de developer had requested, and um, just trying to work with the developer and moving this project forward. Um, that's why I, I had I'd done that. Um, well, the option is to change the phasing and change the construction to only put in those services for what they're asking for permits for now. Wouldn't that be an option? In lieu of going against district policy? Yeah, you could do that. And put the, put the services in after the fact. I'm saying don't even put in the main unless they have a permit. They need to put the main in in order to get to where, the, where it's flowing. Which which section? It's for, it's it's the it's uh, phase three, the upper right hand portion. Yep. Um, and that area that area actually flows down to the eastern road. Okay. And then back to with also its way back to pump station 11. So that gravity sewer service is what's actually needed and to sewer service these, these areas, that 1,600 feet. Um, so that essentially defined the phase. There are about four or three phases, phase three. Yeah. <coughs> phase three is on, on the plan I'm looking at. Okay. You're saying it's the one along <coughs> Eastern Trail. Is the, what's that? The phase three you're talking about is the phase three along yeah, Eastern Trail? Yeah, that, that, that requires the uh, the sewer service. Yeah, because there are about four different phase threes marked on the on the. It's all the part of phase three. It's just the backfilling some of the gaps that have, yeah. have occurred. Some of it does flow into existing sewers, some of it does not. So I'm, I'm interrupting Rob's question, but which, so they're all right in that phase three that are along Eastern Road, or they're in this phase? That's, these are the ones that are getting connected. These three, and those in that corner, but for them to be connected, they have to connect down here. Okay. This next one will show you better. 
Still interrupting Rob's question. Are they going to they going to type? Are they going to put the service line to the property line, and that's it? That was the intent. Yeah. As they passed As we the pass property the line to, to run the, the sewer service to the property line, um, while they had the excavation going on uh, for the 36 lots. And of these 36 lots, are any? multiple units because in the, the capacity letter from FSP on the request, it said there were 69 units total on these 36 lots. Is that still the case? I believe that. No. I would assume one of the lots is a multiple unit lot. I do not know that. How many units it, it is, uh, I don't have that information now. I know they've been working with the town uh, with regards to develop development of that lot. Number of units is still up in the air. Is that one of the A or B lots? That's a dual unit. Uh, 118 is a multiple unit. It, uh, anything that says MF on it is multiple family. Oh, but that one isn't being requested right now. Right now it is not. Mr. Chairman, was there any explanation given as to why? Uh, the fees would not be paid along with the application for for district approval on the phase? No. Um, they just requested for the, the 14 lot approval. Well, I guess absent any kind of extenuating circumstances, I'll have to vote against the motion to approve this um, until there's agreement that the uh, capacity reserve charge will be paid for all the units included in the phase for which we're giving approval and allowing construction to go forward. Um, I just don't think it's prudent for us to depart from our established practices and procedures, which I think are all founded on good rationale um, simply because an engineer for a developer says that's the way it's going to be. So I, I have a question. How, because this has been brought to us in the past and we had some recommendations, mm -hmm. uh, there were some questions about the number of additional units which seemed to be incorrect on the original letter that came to us. Uh, they weren't incorrect. Um, they they were correct at the time. They included that multifamily unit, uh, which has since I guess the number of units on that unit is, is still up in the air. Is my understanding. Okay. So, what has changed since the last time we came, other than the number of? Their initial request was to pay for the capacity reserve fee on a house by house basis as they pulled each sewer permit. Yes, so I remember what that. They, what they, the change here is they've um, increased the number of capacity uh, requests for the number of units. Uh, the phase is still the same phase description of uh, that the town has phase three, the same, the 36 lots. Okay. Um, so what? So how does this differ from asking to do this on a? Lot by lot basis, the capacity reserve fee on a yeah. lot by lot basis. Well, they're asking this for 14 lot versus one lot at a time. They, they were going to okay. up, pay up front 14 lots. Okay. So it's 14 instead of one. So we're still making a concession there on our capacity reserve fee. Yes. I'm going to 14 to one, and I understand we have the developer here, Gary Anderson. Would yep. You um, we came in before asking to do it on a lot by lot basis. That was denied, so we're trying to move the project forward. We don't have a spare 100,000 kicking around, so we're just trying to find a way to get it done. I look at it as the risk is kind of on us. We're going to go and put these extensions to the lots, pave the roads, and we don't have the right to build on the lots unless we come back later for an approval. 
So I understand Mr. Anderson's concern, um, but I also look at it as the risk is on us for putting them in and not having an approval, which most people would do. It's purely an economic issue. We'd rather do it on a lot-by-lot -lot basis, but I also would say that many people in their due diligence that they do or do not do um, in this town are faced with the realization that when they come in to build a house, they're going to spend 10 grand. They're going to get a building permit. They're going to pay a sewer assessment in most cases. They're going to pay a recreation fee. They're going to pay a sewer impact, uh, um, uh, traffic impact fee, school impact fee, and any other impact fee that's been put in place since the last time I checked. So it's incumbent upon anybody who wants to build a house in this town to get educated on what they're looking at doing um, or paying for fees if they're going to build a house. We also control the development, so it's unlikely we haven't thus far uh, sold lots to other people where we've left them with an under, uh, any kind of um, uh, uh, we haven't sold we haven't sold lots uh, where we haven't uh, given full disclosure. In fact, there's only been one lot sale, and they were given full disclosure. Um, we're not in the practice of selling lots, uh, so that's not something that is really going to come up. Uh, we're building the houses on the lots, so the, the party that's, that's doing most of the building in there is fully aware of, of what uh, the requirements are for fees that need to be paid. So. Okay. Thank you. Rob? I'm looking for a little education from the board members who've been here for a while. This project was previously uh, approved with phases. And was it at that time stated that when this would come back in phases, that the impact fee would be paid by phases? In that the typical... That, is, that has been the district policy. I, what was stated with regards to this project, I don't know. I was not... So well, the developers here, but I, I think my recollection is that the capacity reserve fees were paid by phases as the project was developed. Is that incorrect, Harry? Well, there there haven't been any capacity reserve fees due yet. Be That's right. Because there's there was a an allotment of 52 units covering the 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 property, and thus far we've built like 40 homes. Okay. So this will be the first instance when we're coming up against the capacity reserve fee. Um, and when the original project was approved, we knew that there were a certain number of units that were grandfathered underneath the original assessment, right, in that there would be capacity fees on the remaining units? We knew that, yes. No. And, and the district policy has always been that they should be paid for incomplete by phase is the past. So if we were to do something different tonight, then a developer could come in shortly after this and say, well, you know, I want to put in all the sanitary for 63 lots, 74 lots or whatnot, but I only want to pay for these 14. And, you know, we have to police at that point to make sure that the fees get paid in the appropriate time. Uh, I just don't know, and I'm kind of siding with Charlie on this, why would we want to go against the practice that we've had in the past and the direction that the board has had in the past? And that's why I'm looking to some of the more senior members here. You know, if we haven't done it in the past, why would it be a good, good option now? I don't see any reason why it would be a good option now because of the policing of it after the fact that to go and chase down all these different lots as they get developed. I mean, I'm not, I, I know, I'm not saying Kerry would do that, but if somebody would come in and just start building because they have the, they have the service line to the, to the building. Just, uh, or just describe the process that takes place in the, at the district offices when a uh, development gets approved and the capacity reserve fee is uh, agreed upon, um, we develop a, a list of um, the lots 
home, uh, the both by uh, uh, map and lot number, uh, subdivision lot number, and street address of the approved uh, lots um, for the subdivision. And as the per as um, permits are pulled for each lot, we uh, match them up to the subdivision list that we have and work off of that list. And so, so this approval, as it's worded, for example, does not dictate which 14 lots the capacity reserve fee is being paid on. Yes, it does. It does? Yes, it does. It identifies the, the lots uh, by the, the subdivision lot number. 103A, 104, 104A. Oh, that's the remaining nine lot reference? Yes. How much of a bookkeeping problem is it for the district to keep, a track, keep track of which ones are given permits for? Um, it'd be the same effort as if the entire lot would be, the uh, subdivision was approved. So just to clarify that. In order for a home to be built on any of the lots that have not been paid, have not been paid a capacity reserve fee, they would need a permit. And at that time, we would require the capacity reserve fee at the. No, um, at at that time, and this has actually happened. Um, a permit would be requested for a subdivision lot that is not that we don't have approval for and we don't issue um, a sewer permit uh, for, for that lot because it hasn't gone through the approval process. With the, the, the it seems to me it's going to be very confusing five years down the road for somebody to remember that lot 126 in phase three of this project has or hasn't had the capacity, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> has or hasn't had the capacity reserve fee paid, that it's it's a lot more likely that uh, the capa capacity reserve fee has been paid for phase three of this project and the sewer extension permit issued. And that, done, that, that allows then permits to be issued for every lot within that phase without question. Would seem to be, from my experience um, a more certain way to be sure that there's no confusion or surprises to individuals when they walk in the door. They buy a lot and they know it's clear as far as the sewer district is concerned and, uh, and go from there. So if we can cut back, I, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to accept capacity reserve charge on 14 units, but I'm not willing to see sewer construction take place and complete the construction to service 36 units when only 14 units are proposed to be serviced. Uh, I, I, agree. I, guess, I guess I would need, I would need a comprehensive recommendation from the superintendent to the board for us to depart from that practice because every other, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> every other developer who comes forward is going to want the same concession. Uh, there's nobody who's going to come in here and say, "Yeah, I'm willing to pay for you in advance and, and, and upfront the money if you're going to let other people come in here and just say, even without explanation, we're going to pay you for 14 of, of the 36." And at what point do the remaining 36 get paid? Is it, well, I'll pay two more, and I'll pay two more, and I'll pay two more? You know, in, in you're looking at other projects coming down the road, like Charlie said, that, you know, I want to put all this sewer in because it's more economical for me to put it in now, but I only want to pay for these houses here, and then I'll pay for a couple more and a couple more. If we approve the phase that allows construction and connection, I think that's the point at which the capacity fee needs to be paid. I, you know, I, I in, in my realm of engineering, that, that's always the way it's been when you have a, a type of fee uh, of this nature. Mr. Chairman? Yes. 
if I could. Um, just to make sure that uh, all the members of the board understand the process. Uh, whenever somebody goes to get a building permit, they need to, in a sewered area, they need to go down to the sanitary district and pull a sanitary permit. Without a sanitary permit, they're not going to get a building permit. And upon pulling a sanitary permit, I don't think the sanitary district would give out a sanitary permit unless capacity reserve fee was paid as well, if the sanitary district knew that the capacity reserve fee was not paid. We're merely trying to move the project forward. And we cannot, uh, practically speaking, build the infrastructure uh, and not put the the extensions from the main into the lots. Uh, we can't go back later on and dig through the water and, and under drain and electric and pavement and gravel and everything else to go and put extensions in. And we would not be coming in on a case-by-case -case basis or a two-lot by two-lot basis. We would, as I would imagine, have to come back to the district and ask for an extent, ask for approval on a next on a next round of lots, and it was always my understanding, or at least in, in intent, that that would be what we would do, with the understanding that we would not have lots that were developable until that capacity reserve fee was paid. So the so the liability I looked at prior to this meeting as being more on us for putting the sanitary uh, extensions into the lots and not having lots that could be developed. I think there's an argument to be made for that because most people wouldn't do that. They're, they're spending the infrastructure with no guarantee that they're going to get the capacity at the district to sewer those lots. Again, I, I would ask the board if, if, if the two uh, ways that we've asked to do this don't work, what is it that will work? I don't think that coming back and digging through the road to extend off of the main is, is really something that's practical. Thank you. Now, Charlie, did you have a comment? Or? Well, I think, I think having a recorded documented plan on file that shows all of this stuff is buildable, signed off, recorded, and the last surprise being an individual comes to the sanitary district and finds out that they owe fees on property that they have acquired before they can build, puts us in a position that is really untenable. That I understand Kerry's intention right now is not to sell any lots, but his situation could, ch could change tomorrow and he could decide he has to sell all these lots individually. That's his free choice to make. And then we have individuals coming to us, finding out because of an oversight during the transaction process or whatever that, you know, yeah, they owe us an additional $3,000 fee and they're going to go ballistic and we're the ones we're the ones who are going to be dealing with that. Our superintendent, our clerical staff, and us as individual trustees are going to be dealing with folks who are angry because of this last-minute surprise. My experience has always been these fees, as long as everybody is aware of them in advance and can plan and program for them, are things that folks can deal with. And we have not historically allowed uh, individual lots to be sold. If we're going to change that policy, fine, we'll change that policy, but we need to do that with our eyes open. I mean, we've got the next agenda item here dealing with a lot with capacity reserve fees to be paid. Those folks are not going to volunteer to come forward and pay those fees if they know they can pay them piecemeal instead. So we just need to do this in a comprehensive fashion if we feel like it needs to have a modification made. I think that if the documentation shows that the capacity reserve fee is paid on these lots on the recorded plan and that the remaining lots are required to pay that fee in the future before sewer connections can be done, I feel a little bit better about that. In essence, we're getting another phase shown on the plans, but there's at least an opportunity for disclosure 
by somebody who's doing their research. Otherwise, there's no recorded document that, that anybody can find that would let them know that there was a fee to be paid. And then we're going to be dealing with more issues on an increasing basis. And I'm not comfortable that eight or nine or 10 or 12 or 14 years from now that our staff, if there's turnover, is going to be aware that they failed to collect fees on some of these lots. And I think it just sets things up for mistakes to be made. I, I, I agree with Charlie that if we're going to require you know, of all developers, you know, like the next application that is coming forth, that they play the the impact fees to be able to develop by phase. They need to pay all of them that put in the infrastructure to serve that phase. And I, I don't know why there is a need, and that's, once again, I'm looking to the more senior members of the board here, to tell me that we've done it in the past or why it's a good reason. Right now, Charlie's the only one who's told me what we have done and, and why we should proceed that way. And I... And right now, my mind is that's the way it's got to be. You know, unless we have a policy change, and if we want a policy change, then we need to back up, put this project on hold, and then sit down and decide what policy we want to have. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman. Yeah. I just want to get a clarification. Charlie, um, did you mention that? Did I understand correctly that if another phase was identified, let's call it phase 3A, that just 14 lots, even though they provided infrastructure to service the 36 lots, that would be okay and we approve phase 3A? Well, I'd be, I'd be more inclined to think there was some protection there by virtue of disclosure, but I'm not happy with the concept okay, of I'm issuing permits for more work than has been paid for. If there, there's another, I suggested this once again, you know, doing it by phase. I understand that this all flows downhill and that you can put the infrastructure in down at the bottom of the hill. Well, can't you do those lots first and we grant the approvals on a phase down there for those lots? And that will be 3A, and you can put the infrastructure in for 3A in in in. in then he's approved for that. And when he wants to come back for 3B, he can build the rest of the sanitary in, in Section 3. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just for the record, there is full disclosure on a plan that does describe the lots that do have capacity reserve and, uh, paid in advance, and it is recorded. So everything that you're talking about is in place currently. Where would that be? At the registry. It's right on the Mylar. It's hatched, it's hatched over right on the Mylar, showing which ones have the uh, right to be built upon and which ones don't. Yeah, that's, that's, uh... you're, you're probably not looking at a Mylar. You may be looking at a submission. But the Mylar that's recorded has got that information crystal clearly. Is the subdivision plan already recorded? Yes. Oh, yes. So is it going to be amended to show this change? We will amend it to show this change if you request, if you ask us to. So that's it's going to go through the planning board process, and and they're going to sign a new mylar that's going to show the additional lots that have been covered by the permit that is paid. We wouldn't know. You'll do that on an incremental basis as you go forward with each section. I will. If that's what it takes to move this project forward, I will. I don't see why the planning board wouldn't sign it. All it is is just acknowledgement to clarify the issue that you're describing that we can then put on record. But if that's what it takes to do, absolutely. I mean, it's a simple process. I, I have a couple questions. Uh, first, a comment. I think a simplest process would be to follow the way everyone else has done it and pay the, impact, uh, the capacity reserve fee right up front. That would be the simplest thing, instead of trying to make us revise our policy on the fly. The second thing is, my understanding is the capacity reserve fee is you're purchasing capacity. If you put a pipe in the ground for 14 lots that are the farthest away from the discharge point, and you have sewer connections for all those lots between there and Eastern Road, but we run out of capacity 
you can't connect to those lots because you haven't paid for the capacity for those lots. So that's, that's exactly right. So liabilities on us. You know, <laughs> but why not just do what Rob says and build up? And as you get capacity and lots sold, just keep on going. Well, it. it and, and it, that's my point. There's issues with, with respect to that. Um, if but. you're paying for a capacity fee, you're building the infrastructure and you're allowed to build Go for it. Yes. And I guess what we were looking for is if we wanted a, a, a special case, which is that, which sounds to me what you're requesting, otherwise you would have paid the, impact, the capacity reserve fee on those extra lots or the 36 lots. Um, I don't think the case has been made very well for a hardship here. They really don't. I have a slightly different type of question. If maybe you can explain. During the subdivision process, how much education is given about the nature and the structure of sort capacity fees and what the developer's responsibility is in terms of phasing and sequencing? <coughs> and are they made aware of how they are supposed to pay those fees? and? Uh, how those exactly work as part of the permitting process? Yeah, it's there. They, they, there's always this discussion of what the fees is going to be, when, you know, when they would be due. And so before they even break ground, before they get approval, they know that they need to pay those fees. So there's no surprise in terms of the economics of it that those fees are going to be apparent. Uh, the only difference in this case here is this is such a large project that um, it's very. It, it's one of a kind, really, in, in, the, in the town. So. This is one of a kind versus what the Great American Neighborhood. The amount of phasing that's going on on it is, but there's a lot of phasing in the Great American Neighborhood. And there's a lot of phasing on the next project on the agenda. Yeah. Is there? Two phases. L looking at both sides of this, and I see why Kerry wants to do this, and I know why. We shouldn't allow him to do what he's asking to do at this point. Um, I think this should be tabled, studied a little more, and come to a uh, clearer, more straightforward approach to it than what we see here tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess if that's the case, I think the superintendent should also talk with the planning department with regard to um, Mr. Anderson's offer to record sequential amended subdivision plans at the Registry of Deeds to reflect the incremental payment of, uh, of fees, because I'm not sure that I'm convinced in my own mind that the planning department and the planning board will want to see that kind of those kinds of amendments that don't deal with lot lines and property development. I, I'm not sure. I think I, I think I might be satisfied with that, but I'm not sure there's a, that the process will be that be that smooth from the planning side of things. Because I know my experience has always been an amended subdivision plan generally deals with changing lot boundaries and modifications of that sort, um, and not trying to deal with administrative process, but. I could I could be wrong, so I'll, I would move to table um, to give the superintendent an opportunity to try to resolve these issues and come back to us with a uh, comprehensive approach to uh, let me let me let me restate that with a recommendation with regard to. Um, the collection of the capacity reserve fees for these projects and see whether um, a change is warranted at this time. I'll second that. Before we proceed with that, just a question for the developer. How is that going to impact your schedule if we delay another month? Significantly. Sewer is ready to start being laid next week. You know, I, I the board has a policy, and I agree that we shouldn't be put into a position um, as a crisis, and I think we need to think about this uh, a little more 
if that's the road we want to do is to change the next step of policy that's going to open the door for other developers to make the same request. There are other options that can be done, uh, building from the, the lowest point up, you know, or paying the fee. So I don't see a need to yeah, go against the established policy that uh, the board has at this time. I have one other question for the developer. During the subdivision process, <coughs> what were your understandings of how the capacity reserve fee should be paid and in what increments? We thought we'd be able to get the board to take it on a case-by-case -case basis because we thought we had done it once before. The project that we're referring to was Enterprise. And after the last meeting, I met with my engineer. We took a look at it. We realized that we were wrong. There was a modification that was made down there, but it wasn't made for a case-by-case -case basis. Um, sorry, Charlie, did you have another comment? Well, I we've got a tabling motion on the floor. I think we could, I think we could, I think we could discuss this till all hours of the night. But I think if they have, if they have to proceed, I'm willing to, I'm willing to make an affirmative vote on their request subject to the full payment of the capacity reserve fee, but I actually have a tabling motion on the floor, and uh, we've already been violating our rules of procedure by debating beyond that tabling motion. I may uh, ask for comments on the, the second motion for the tabling, and then proceed with a vote on that. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch it all. There was multiple people talking. Sorry. Rob? You, you have to proceed with the second motion that's on the table. Ask if there's any comments relative to that mm -hmm. and take a vote. Okay. Um, I, I think Mr. Anderson had a comment he wanted to make. Well, I was just going to ask if there was a uh, way that we could continue on with the sewer lines, taking the risk all upon ourselves for, um, for that risk, but still making sure that we could get inspections from the sanitary district so to ensure that it's being put in into the sanitary district's requirements. We've, yeah, no, I, no, I think that's a, so the motion on the table is as it is. We've had discussion on it um, to table. All in favor of tabling the motion? I'm not opposed. Okay, the next item on the agenda would be new business, and first is the Layton Farm subdivision. Mr. Chairman, um, I need to disclose that uh, I work for the company that has that application before the board, and as such, I believe I should recuse myself from consideration of this matter. Thank you, Rob. <coughs> Dave? Uh, on behalf of Layton Farm, LLC, Sebago Technics is requesting district approval to connect and discharge into the sewer the waste water from a proposed Layton Farm subdivision. Phase one consisting of 23 single family homes located off Elmwood Ave Avenue. The subdivision will be serviced by both gravity and pressure sewer systems. The gravity portion, 12 homes, will, be, will discharge into a new manhole to be located on the existing gravity lines and flow to Elmwood Avenue pump station. The pressure sewer portion, 11 homes, will discharge into an existing uh, manhole that flows to the Nonsuch River pump station. The sewer system consists of approximately 560 linear feet of 8-inch gravity sewer, four manholes, and 1,600 feet of 3-inch pressure sewer. The sewer manholes and sewer, la sewer laterals within the uh, public right-of-way would be transferred over to the sanitary district upon completion of the project. This, is, this stage is part of a larger uh, project which is anticipated to have a total of 97 homes. I recommend approval with the following conditions. This lot was part of the Eight Corners Development District. The parent lot was assessed for one single family home, which was sub subsequently connected to the sewer. Consequently, the entire project subject to the capacity reserve fee. The capacity reserve fee based on single family residential dwelling units without accessory units. Any additional homes, dwelling units, accessory units, and excessive are subject to additional approval from the capacity reserve fee. Capacity reserve fee per home is 28.62 and 29 cents. On July 2014 ENR and is 
adjusted monthly. Based on the current ENR index, the total capacity reserve fee for the 23 dwelling units is $65,832.68. The capacity reserve fee is due prior to issuance of the sewer extension permit. Uh, positive displacement pumps and building laterals, which are installed as part of the low-pressure sewer system, shall be purchased, owned, and operated by the property owner. The re recorded subdivision plan shall include the following note. Sewer service is by means of a pressure sewer system, and each pump building lot is serviced by an individual pumping system owned, operated, and maintained by the homeowner. Owners and occupants of, pre of premises serviced by pressure sewer systems shall Expressly release the Federal Sanitary District from any and all liabilities associated with the use, operation, or malfunction of the pressure sewer system. A copy of the recorded subdivision plan shall be provided to the district in both paper and electronic format. All sewer pipes shall be SDR 11 HDPE pipe and shall be the color green. Installation shall be in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. Stainless steel curtain stop with integral check valve shall be installed in the sewer service within the property boundaries at the property line. Valve box cover shall be embossed with sewer detail provided. Not, is not acceptable. You've got to utilize uh, the district's detail. Uh, locate a flushing manhole at Force Main's termination, station 12 plus 93 within the right of way of Owens Way in accordance with district details. Provide an air vacuum release manhole at an approximate station 2 plus 0 in accordance with district details. All force mains and sewer services shall be de shall have the detectable underground utility marking be placed approximately 3 feet below grade, directly above the, uh, the pipe. Provide a copy of the detailed zone analysis and design, da design data. Final plan signed, stamped by a licensed professional engineer submitted to the superintendent for approval prior to issuance of the permit. Sewer extension permit is required. A complete application and associated fee shall be submitted to the district prior to any sewer extension work. Sewer permit is required for each house. A completed application and associated fee shall be submitted to the district at the time the permit is executed. Prior to permit being executed, no sewer, state sewer work shall be completed. Installation of the sewer, sewer service shall be inspected by the district and professionally surveyed electronic geo-reference CAD drawings and stamped pre-check CAD drawings. And paper copy to be submitted to the district on completion of the project. And that is the end of my recommendation. I will entertain a motion for approval. Move approval, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. Well, that was close one again. That was. <laughs> I'm going to give it to Charlie again. <laughs> That's the first voice I heard. Sorry, Ben. I think Dave Sorry. actually <laughs> said it. Oh, it was Dave one of you? <laughs> Sorry. You just like Charlie or something. Yeah. Any questions? None. All in favor of approval? None opposed. Next item is the amendment to Article 4, Building Sewers and Connections. Um, amendment to Article 4 of the Building Sewer and Connections, Section 1, Paragraph E of the Scarborough Sanitary District Sewer Regulations. I recommend adding the following um, text, paragraph E. I'll, I'll read the text and I'll, I'll emphasize what <coughs> the uh, recommendation is, uh, recommended changes are. A separate ind and independent building sewer shall be provided for every building. Where one building stands at the rear of another or an interior lot, no private sewer is available or can be constructed to the rear building through an adjoining alley, courtyard, or driveway. The building sewer from the front building may be extended to the rear building and the whole considered as one building sewer, provided that the prior approval is granted by the district. This is the beginning of the new text. Where a single family home has an accessory outbuilding, the sewer service from the single family home may be extended to the accessory outbuilding upon execu execution of, to the sa satisfaction of the district superintendent and legal counsel, a perpetual covenant running with the land subject to the terms hereof. The grantor or then owner must install a second sewer connection to the accessory outbuilding at the earlier of such time that the structures of the property are no longer in common ownership or to the water and or electric utilities for the structures become separately used. And that's the end of the new text. It's recommended to be added. 
Once again, I'll like approve, Mr. Chairman. Second. Approval and second. Questions? I have a question. Uh, why was the language chosen for district superintendent and legal counsel? That makes it seem like we might need to have some kind of written letter from the legal counsel. Why wouldn't we simplify it to just simply say, to the satisfaction of the district? I think the wording is good because we do want our legal counsel to look at it. And if we put just a district, a future superintendent may construe that if he's okay with it. That's what he is. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I would recommend striking the superintendent and legal counsel. We can certainly look at getting the legal counsel to sign off on things, but we're not required to do that as this language seems to indicate. So somebody could come back and ask us, where did your legal counsel sign off on that? Uh, just a semantics issue, I think, for me. The, the, the uh, is the point of the wording um, to have legal counsel review the perpetual covenants document that's going to be submitted? Correct. And we don't have a single document. In other words, I'd agree with what Seth is saying. If we had a boilerplate covenant type document that we uh, uh, would require the uh, property owners to submit to us so that if you work with legal counsel, develop the form of the release. Um, and then I would agree it would, should just be subject to the approval of the superintendent. But I think what we're anticipating here is that we're going to get different types of draft covenants submitted to us that would be submitted to the district's legal counsel for review. Am I, am I on the mark? That's what I was anticipating. Um, the, you know, the, the other approach is to change the language as uh, Mr. Garrison had recommended and take this opportunity to work with our legal counsel to develop a, dry, a uh, standing covenant that would be moved forward. With. And do, sorry, it, does that satisfy your question? Y yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so this draft document, uh, obviously there's going to be somewhere down the road a homeowner that would take issue with our draft or their legal counsel may take issue with that draft document and then we would require, so <coughs> we don't necessarily save a step. Save a step. Is, I guess that's, that's what I'm getting at. I mean, there is the potential that a homeowner is going to come to us and say, we don't like your language in your draft. We're going to have our legal counsel draft our own. Mm -hmm. um, so that wouldn't necessarily negate the use <coughs> of that text in our policy, correct? Spells it out pretty clear. Yeah. Rob? David, did you run this by the attorney? Yes. He did, you did? Mm -hmm. And he was okay with the language? Mm -hmm. If he's reviewed it and it's sufficient? Um, yeah, I think I. Yes, Charles. I think I suggest that we adopt the language as it is, and maybe we ask the superintendent to look into uh, a uh, <coughs> sort of a boilerplate kind of document, and maybe we could maybe we could make the revision oh, wow. to it later. But I would think if we had our own boilerplate document, that would take care of the and legal counsel review, Seth. Anyway, going down in the future, because we have a document that our legal counsel has provided to us that we're using. Yeah, my suggestion is not that we avoid legal counsel. It's just simply the way the language is written right now. We're bound to get a legal opinion every time we do one of these. Right. And I just wanted to give us the flexibility not to be bound to get a legal opinion. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. And I think, I think if we adopt this the way it's written and the superintendent gets a document that we can use. Then if somebody wants to depart from that, that would have to be reviewed by legal counsel at that point in time, but probably 90% of the time they're going to just accept our document and that's going to be the way it would work. Mm -hmm. And that document would count as the legal counsel? That's in once the it's, yeah, once department. it's been submitted to us by our legal counsel, I don't think there'd be any further, until somebody wanted to depart from it, in which case we'd I'm sure I want to have our legal counsel take another look at a new document. 
Any other questions? I got a question. Yes. So on the, when you get the legal uh, staff involved, a legal counsel involved, is there a cost associated with that, or is it just part of the, the normal the fee that we pay yearly? There will be a cost associated with yeah. that. Um, and we don't uh, actually pay a retainer, I don't believe. So. What's that? I don't think we actually pay a retainer, do we? We do pay a retainer. Do we? Yeah, we, do a, we have a retainer we have, um, that we pay our legal counsel. So they, they are available for us, but um, they're, they're, I meant to, and frankly I forgot to add language in here that any legal costs would be, should be uh, borne by the applicant. That's probably a good addition to the language. That yeah, would probably address Seth's concern too. Wouldn't it? Yes. Then would it be prudent to table this until our next meeting? I would agree, tabling it until our next meeting, unless we have anything that uh, is riding on the nope. rework of this nope, language. No, this is just uh, as a result of our workshop. Okay. Motion to table. We have an existing motion, don't we, on the floor? Okay. Yes, we no, we just need to amend it. Okay. Well, a tabling motion takes precedence. Right. So we have a motion to table. Do we have a second? Second. Second. No questions about that motion. All in favor of approval of tabling the motion until next meeting. Two opposed. I'm abstaining. <laughs> oh, you were abstaining? One opposed. I thought that was Nick. I didn't see his hand. Okay, so the next item is the amendment to Article 12, Schedule of Rates. Um, amendment to Article 12, Schedule of Rates, Section 2, Capacity Reserve Fund of the Scarborough Sanitary District Sewer Regulations, um, Paragraph I, I'd like to recommend add the following text as I highlight as I read the, the paragraph. Capacity charges shall be calculated based on the average daily flow of wastewater to be generated by project service by the extended sewer. This is the beginning of the new text. Where actual flows are in excess of the proposed flows, the excess flows are subject to additional approvals and capacity reserve charges. Oh, I'm sorry. That's this is the new text. Um, flows are measured based on average daily flows as defined in these regulations. Whenever actual flows exceed prior approved proposed flows assessed on an average daily flow basis, such, such excess flows are subject to district approval and an additional capacity reserve charge. That's the end of the new text. Uh, continuing with the remaining text, uh, the following table shall be used as a minimum basis estimating average daily flows. Move approval, Mr. Chairman. Seconded. Questions? Where did you get the new text? I don't. Did we get a copy of that? I had emailed it to you. Email. Oh, email. Yeah. I never look at that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, when did you email it recently? I, I um, a couple of days ago. I really? Can I remember um, when I. <coughs> Sent the packet out. I indicated right. that it was currently under review by our council, okay. and this was the, the modified language. All right. Wendy, could you make a note to send a carrier pigeon to Mr. Viola? <laughs> <laughs> Call me when you send me a text, will you? Or an email. <laughs> Rob, should we have some discussion about those projects that exceed? the established um, capacity reservation relative to a different rate? That would, at this time, anything that uh, impacts rates has to go through a public hearing. Okay. Um, and that is on my um, to-do list to develop and present to the trustees in the, in the near term where we uh, make a recommendation, rate, rate, rate schedule change with that being a part of it, but that will have to go through a public hearing process. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Hughes. There's no other questions. All in favor of approval? None opposed on that one. 
And the last item on our new business is seven month budget summary. Seven month budget summary is included in your packet. I recommend approval. Move okay. approval, Mr. Chairman. Seconded. Ooh, a second. Any questions on this? Hearing none, all in favor of approval? Not opposed on that, that I could see. <coughs> Next item, public comments. The comment public has left this evening. Trustee comments, I'll start over to my left with Ben. Uh, no comments tonight, thank you. No comments. Nick? I want to send my condolences to Jay and Glenn for their losses this past month. Thank you. Seth? Yeah, I would echo that as well, too. Thank you. Dave? I'd like to congratulate Ken on passing again. It, it's really amazing he, he did that. And uh, I'd like to extend my condolences to Jay and Glenn and the family, and also Gary Howard and and Rachel and the uh, loss of uh, his mother-in-law a little while ago. Well, uh, I'd like to echo those condolences also to uh, Jay, Glenn, and, and uh, uh, Rachel and uh, whatnot. And uh, also, congratulations once again to Ken Welch for his, his accomplishment. Uh, just amazing how well the, the staff continues to uh, excel and, and make the district look good. Um, and last, uh, well, two things. One, school is open. Make sure everybody out there takes due care uh, with all the <coughs> children out at bus stops and whatnot. And uh, enjoy the holiday weekend. Charlie. Yeah, I also would like to uh, echo the condolences. Um, and to congratulate Ken Welch on his accomplishment. Also, to wish everybody a safe and happy Labor Day weekend. It's hard to believe the end of the summer season has rolled upon us already. It seems like it just started the 4th of July. So. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, again, echoing the condolences. Congratulations to Ken. Uh, and uh, have a safe and happy Labor Day weekend. And Motion to adjourn. Second. And second, all in favor of adjournment. We are adjourned.